So it uh, brings us on to our second talk, uh, where we're going to talk about building a diverse team. Um, I've got two really interesting uh, speakers to join me, um, and I'm going to ask them to join me uh, now. So I've got uh, Dorothy, who is EDNI lead for Vodafone for the UK, and I've also got Peter joining me, who is managing director for DKMS. So let's give them a little clap. And I'm going to awkwardly bump down on this seat now and get up like an old man probably in a bit. Um, so thank you both for joining me. The uh, microphone's just uh, here, guys. I gave you a brief introduction, but I always feel like it's best to um, let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, so, Dorothy, if you start us off. Yes, hello. Is it on? I'll just flick it up on the side. There you go. Hello everyone, I am Dorothy Odigawa. I am currently the DEI lead for racial equality in Vodafone UK. And you did a really good introduction. Um, I essentially lead all things EDI when it comes to racial equality, and that's throughout the whole kind of employee life cycle. I partner with people across the business from leadership to our employee networks to ensure that we create the right environment for people to thrive. Uh, Peter McLee, I, uh, I represent the charity DKMS, and for those of you who don't know what we do, we, we register people to the stem cell donor registry for patients who have blood cancer, and so it's really important that not only we, uh, we have a, a workforce that's representative and reflective of the communities we need to engage with, not because it's just the right thing to do, but it's literally a life-saving endeavour, and the best way in which to engage with these communities is to, is to make sure that we have people who understand those communities, who can have credible uh, connections to them, so in my new role as, as managing director, it's incumbent upon me to make sure that um, the, uh, the barriers that, that Nick so articulately spoke about in his, in his presentation are not, are not presented to those people who we want to come and work with our organisation. So it's a real privilege for me to be in that role. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to be invited to come and talk to you guys today. Lovely. Thank you both. Uh, so, Dorothy, uh, my first question comes to you. Um, and we often hear about the link between uh, diversity and creativity. Can you share some examples of how diversity has improved creativity and financial performance at Vodafone or in any of your other roles as well? Because I know Vodafone's yeah. a bit of a new one for you. <laughs> no, definitely. I think there's such an intrinsic, intrinsic link between diverse teams and creative thinking, creative problem solving. McKinsey reports, various reports um, highlight this. And the way that we've been, or I've been able to do it throughout my career, is um, ensuring that psychological safety. I think you can't have people being comfortable sharing their thoughts and sharing their ideas if there isn't that environment where people are appreciated for their maybe wacky or you know left field thoughts and ideas. So a lot of the work I do is working with managers on highlighting the ways that they can bring forth these really, really um, interesting, different ideas, and therefore create really um, creative ways to push the business forward, create creative ways in terms of marketing to um, have new branding types and styles and initiatives. Um, I previously worked at GIFGAF, and I partnered with the brand and marketing team um, on a framework to inject EDI into the work they do. So that's partnering with agencies and other kind of marketing um, individuals to create the best kind of um, outcomes for our, um, our um, company. And so we were able to create some really creative adverts and the numbers kind of spoke for themselves after we had kind of in introduced that initiative. So I would recommend um, ensuring that you've got the right environment to inject that creative thought and also pairing that with um, sort of structural frameworks that allow um, people in the organisation to naturally inject EDI as well. Yeah, and no, I think that's a really important point, actually. And I'm going to go slightly back to the Heinz Beans, um, who uh, are getting quite a lot of uh, stick, as Nick mentioned. Um, but actually, Nick made a good point that maybe there wasn't somebody in the room there to, to kind of highlight that. Uh, actually, I would kind of semi-challenge your thought there in there may well have been but to Dorothy's point is, do those people feel like they have a voice and an opportunity to stand up? And that's why I think both are really important in that conversation. And I actually wrote a note as Nick was speaking. I was like, yeah, what if they were in the room, but they didn't feel comfortable enough to share their insight? I think it's one thing to get people through the door. It's another thing to encourage them to be their best selves and thrive once they're in the door or in the room. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to go to you, Peter, um, what steps has DKMS taken to recruit and support minority talent? And I guess also, um, 
personally and from a DKMS perspective? Why do you think that's really important? And we, I was looking at some of the numbers that underpin our organisation. We, we currently have about 62 to 63 people on, uh, on, on staff. And uh, in our senior leadership team, there's over 60% are female and over 70% of the overall staff are women as well. And I had a chat with our head of HR and Alia as well, who, who's with us today. And I think it's more a, it's been a sense of, um, it's happened more by consequence than design because the charity sector is very much more, um, there are more women who work in the charity sector and, and you know, we can debate the whys and wherefores as to the reality behind that. But I would invite all of you to come up to Chiswick and we'll, we'll happily host any of you to, and you can have a look at the organisation because we are, a, you know, it's not just from a gender perspective but we've got such a broad church of different ethnicities and, and, and different walk, people in different walks of life. Now, and, and my question to myself is, is that a success? I'm not quite sure what success really looks like because this has happened organically and, and it's where we go from here. Now, my, my job is to make sure that, I mean, it's fundamentally it's recognising that communication is, is key to success here. So, like I said, marketing is, is a form of communication and that's why it's really interesting to sort of attend today. But from my perspective, it's making sure that we don't just... We don't just accept where we're at as some kind of success because we didn't mean for this to happen. It just kind of did happen. And we're sort of benefiting from that. And from I say from the life saving perspective of the work that we do, you know, we see we see the impact that we have out in the real world, and there's still a lot more to go. But um, you know, I sort of kind of touched upon it on our table in that people reference the term journey a lot, and in my mind that kind of implies there's an end point. But I don't know what success and all the end point looks like. But actually, Dorothy, when you were talking the table, you know, it's a very simple. Uh, measure of success is that we don't need to do this anymore. You know, that it's here and it's embedded and it's in the organisation. And so for me, you know, all the decisions that I think about and make, it's all about not just waiting for things to happen to us now, but proactively recognising my own, you know, that there are going to be blind spots. I don't know everything. I'm, you know, I, I don't have all the answers. But I don't want this to be a bolt on. And so for me today, I don't want to walk away from here feeling like, you know, ED&I is something which we should have. It should be embedded into the organisation. And, and so moving forward to now, it really is all about aspiring to get to what you were saying about it's, it's, it's there, it's within the organisation. And, and to Nick's point around not having that middle management barrier where people might step away is having the you know the role models there and as we project outwards into the into the broader marketplace and like I say for us um, it's about recognizing that diversity it's more than just this superficial lens this superficial veneer that sits in front of all of us and you know marketing being this multi-sensory discipline it's 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 we have to use it, but I also have to recognise there are limitations to where we're at. The real world lived experience comes in the office every single day. It comes on the tube. It comes in rooms like this where we talk about it, we recognise it, but there's a depth to what we're trying to achieve here. And my job now is to make sure that I recognise that depth and um, don't treat it as the bolt on this. Sometimes I think um, it can be, it shouldn't be a bolt on. It's, it's fundamental to the success of our organisation. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. And Dorothy, you've been speaking uh, previously about uh, both visible and invisible diversity. Um, but how do you ensure intersectionality is considered when you're building a team? Yeah, I think it's really important, the topic of intersectionality. I think when we don't consider it, a lot of identities can slip through the net. Um, at Vodafone, um, we've got d &I leads for different areas within EDI. And so I manage racial equality. We've got an LGBTQ plus lead, disability lead, and also a gender equality lead. And I think small things such as breaking it apart to allow us to then work together is really powerful. Um, in previous roles, I've been the only EDI manager or lead in the business. And it's so easy to just for me to just think on my own about myself and naturally bias slip through the net. Um, I'm a black woman and therefore maybe I'm leaning towards the identity of black women as well. Um, but the way that Vodafone's done it is really, really um, simple but smart. And I think that allows us to approach problems in the organisation as well, individually but also collaboratively. And when we manage our um, employee networks, which are also broken out obviously into different areas within EDI, we're able to tackle issues, challenges, again on an individual basis but also, also together. And so um, I think just keeping it at the forefront of our minds creating structural changes that reflect the kind of impact we want to have on these intersectional identities is really important as well. And so we do that through, you know, HR, so that's EDI, and also through our employee network. So that's kind of ingraining it into the thoughts and the minds of our people, um, seeing it in our employee networks and the initiatives that happen when the employee networks collaborate as well. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I, I like the, the kind of split uh, groups there. 
But I also wonder, and it's quite an interesting point because you see it with a lot of those bigger businesses, you have EDI groups. How does that translate, or what are Vodafone doing to ensure that the work that those groups are doing is also translating into other areas of the business, so i.e. marketing? Because what I'm sure they're trying to avoid is those discussions becoming siloed and, and kind of almost just meetings about mm. things that then never get done. It's about how do we make the action as well. Yeah, and so the way that we do it at Vodafone is make, we make sure that our employee networks work really closely with HR. And so HR business partners partner with different areas within the organisation. So that's tech, that's IT, that's marketing, that's brand, etc. And so um, you're right, it's really, really easy for these conversations to happen only within the networks and therefore change doesn't really get made. Um, we ensure that we loop in people from all areas of the business, at all levels of the business as well. Each employee network has a senior leader who is um, a chair or a sponsor. And so um, defining the role of a sponsor or a chair is really important. You know, how much work do they need to do to um, be part of that network and actually contribute to it? It's also um, it's also part of the bonus packages. So they do need to kind of step up and do the work. Um, but yeah, we make sure we partner really closely with people across the business um, in these kind of specific business areas um, to make sure that change does happen. That's a really good question. Yeah, no. Uh, the interesting point, I guess, is because often you mentioned on the table up there, that you can kind of almost this work can become siloed as a, as a sense. And, and Peter, I guess um, you mentioned about the diversity within your team. Um, how are you creating an environment where team members from diverse backgrounds can feel included and valued? And then I guess equally, how is that translated out for um, kind of the Marcoms that you're putting out as well, I guess, is what are you seeing from that as an output as well? I mean, we're trying to strip away, to a, well, to a certain extent, the um, the impact of, of diversity within the organisation, and that's not that sounds like it's counterintuitive to this conversation, but um, it's, for example, in in, uh, in in the way in which we um, set salary bands. So it's we set salaries based on the job, not on the individual. So there's certain bands that you work within, but broadly speaking, if you come into the organisation at DKMS. There is a band of, of, of negotiation, but the job has a certain so we're stripping away a gender pay gap, for example. It's not it's nothing to do with being linked to who you are to a certain extent. So the job demands that. And then it's about having, you know, a broad church of individuals who actually are in positions of influence, not just, you know, the, on the front line. Yes, you have to start, you, everyone has to start their career, but it's making sure that when we have the opportunity to hire in, that we do think critically about who we're hiring in. And, and it's about me getting out of the way to a certain extent and the usual people getting out of the way to make these decisions. It's, it's very easy sometimes, and I've come in and, and I've found quite a, a bureaucratic hierarchy. It's quite linear in terms of the way things work. And for me, it's important that one person doesn't have the final say in these conversations. And so when it comes to um, promotions, pay reviews, who we're hiring, instead of having one person, and, and you know, if, if that one person gets out of bed on the right side one day, you might say yes, on the other day you might say no. And that's not acceptable. So what, I've, what we have put in place is as, as a much more collegiate framework around making these decisions. And the people who are making those decisions are, thankfully, a broad church of individuals. And it just gives a much, a much more open and, and, and collaborative and engagement around decision making. It's slower. So we occasionally become less nimble, but I think ultimately we make the right decisions. And, and for me, it's about treating this, look, looking at the problem that we have within our sphere of control with the depth and respect it deserves. So again, I come back to the same point. It's not about just doing something for the sake of doing it. It's about at every single stage making sure that we recognize that, you know, well, one person isn't the right person to make a decision anyway, but equally, you need the input of all these people, and luckily we've got those people to make the decisions now. So that's how we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, and I think over time, it will bring us to a point where it is ingrained as a culture rather than, I keep coming back to the point you raised, this bolt-on that really landed with what, what, when you were talking. Yeah. Lovely. Um, I guess, Dorothy, I'll, I'll end with um, one last question for you, really. And... Uh, Whenever I come to events like this, um, sometimes they frustrate me, sometimes they like me. They'll frustrate me when I don't have anything to go home with to say to him, look, this is the next thing we should be doing. So I'd love if you could give one or two kind of, I don't want to say silver bullets, but 
real key things for people to take away from today um, about either building a diverse team or supporting diverse talent in their organisation so those voices are heard and I guess listened to as well? I would say assess and then listen to create some change. So I would assess the situation you're in right now. Um, I come from a project management background, so I do love a bit of like a discovery, looking at what's going right, what's going wrong. Really take a look at your organisation with a clear lens, uh, whether it's you as an individual or you in a group, and understand what's going right, what's going wrong, and what are your key kind of um, hurdles that you need to overcome. And then I would also pair that with listening. So I think when you implement change without listening to the affected groups or groups that are kind of cha feeling challenged in an environment, the change that you bring about might not always be effective. So before you start to create some change, listen to the people who have so much feedback to give you, you know, people who are on the ground, people who are from these minority groups maybe, and, and really hear them, listen to their builds, listen to their um, insights. Um, and oftentimes when you listen really well, you start to get some ideation from them. So they start to kind of problem solve already. Um, and so I would pair both of, both of those things um, to then st start to drive some action. That's really useful, hopefully. Uh, you all found that useful as well. Um, thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Peter, for your time, your insights. Um, hopefully that was really useful for everyone.